Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best of the best to help you scale your business from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today's guest is Jorge Poyatos, the founder and co CEO at SeedTag. Jorge, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure. So, we have been in touch for uh, a couple of years or even more. And it's really impressive the, the scaling up journey that you have been through. But for the ones who don't know you, uh, so who is Jorge? And, and please also present us, SeedTag. Uh, Okay, so yeah, uh, so I am one of the founders. Uh, I started the company together with uh, Albert, who is my co-founder, uh, back in 2014. Uh, I am an industrial engineer. I was working at Google by that time uh, at my Madrid office. Uh, and Albert was my colleague, so at, at some point we decided to start our own venture. And uh, yes, SeedTag uh, is an uh, online advertising company. Uh, what we do is we offer contextual advertising uh, to brands so that they can associate their brand to a specific uh, context on the web. Uh, and we do it in a very special way because we integrate the ads into the content uh, so that they look like part of the content, uh, which is having a, a massive impact on the perception of the users. And uh, yeah, the, comp the company started in Spain, uh, we've been internationalizing and today it's, uh, yeah, we are 200 people in, in nine different markets and uh, having a, a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it's been a very nice ride. Love it. Uh, love it. That's, that's really, really amazing. It's, could you share a little bit more some stats in terms of growth? So uh, rounds, uh, ad count, any interval of revenue, whatever you can share just to help position the stage of growth that you are in for the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as I said, we started in 2014, so it's been seven years already. Uh, mm -hmm. We've raised uh, 5 million in total, so not much money. Uh, we're very capital efficient and the company is profitable uh, for quite a few years already. Uh, in terms of revenues, uh, this year we're forecasting to be above 60 million uh, in revenues. Wow. Uh, almost doubling uh, compared to last year. And uh, yeah, and, uh, Spain only weights 20% uh, of that. So still already very diversified uh, geographically. Exactly. Uh, in in terms of people, 200 people, around 70 to 80 people in Madrid office, which is our headquarters, mm -hmm. uh, and 120 spread across the different local offices that we have. Uh, so our structure, uh, all the central team is uh, in Madrid, engineering, product, operations. And then we have commercial offices in, in the different markets that are usually between five and 10 people. Uh, our markets are the UK, France, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. So Europe and Latin, where we are leading this contextual advertising uh, ecosystem. And uh, I don't know, uh, no, no, don't know what else to say. <laughs> it's been a, a nice ride. Thank you so much for helping the audience to understand where you are in, in terms of growth. So maybe we, st we start there with uh, the nine offices that you have uh, at this stage. So with the pandemic, the world uh, accelerated into a, even a more remote world. Of course, any company that is going global needs to uh, face this with pandemic or without pandemic, right? Uh, what makes it easier is that we can travel a little bit more and be more time face to face. Uh, nowadays yeah. we are traveling less and less, so which means less time face to face, and uh, the challenges of managing a more distributed team without having the chance of being face to face uh, creates many challenges in terms of communication, execution, uh, growth, etc. So how how is it being uh, leading a, a distributed team okay. as you go global? Yeah, so it it is always a challenge, uh, especially from a uh, culture perspective, uh, you know, uh, for a company like ours that is uh, growing fast, uh, uh, we have very, a lot of new hires every single year and every single month. 
uh, making sure that everybody embraces the culture and that we breathe uh, exactly. the same uh, spirit and the same ambitions. Uh, it is critical. Um, and having several offices makes it much more complicated because uh, it is difficult to organize events. Uh, even we, with the COVID, it's even more difficult. Uh, so it's very difficult to get people together, organize events. Uh, they speak different languages. So not an easy one. Uh, the way that we do it, uh, it's, uh, we have a, an onboarding process that is very strong and it's uh, critical for the company where we bring mm -hmm. everybody to Madrid. Uh, we train them. We make sure that they understand all these different values of the company and, and the product perfectly. Uh, mm -hmm. They have meetings with us, uh, with the founders, with the different key people in the company. And uh, yeah, I think that that onboarding process is critical. And then we used to organize an annual offsite where we were taking everybody for uh, three days to somewhere in some place in the world. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. But for the last two years, of course, we have not been able to do it. And we're trying to balance that out with uh, more like online uh, online activities. Like we just uh, last week we finished uh, like an Star Wars competition internally, where we were nice. playing uh, like a trivial Star Wars. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we we try to put a lot of uh, effort on on making people feel part of the same the same family, but it is difficult, of course. You also organize kind of all ends to keep everyone on the same page. So how, how does that work in terms of having kind of a focus on like on, on the local market and on the geography that those offices are targeting, but at the same time feeling part of a, of a global company, right? Yeah, providing visibility uh, about the entire company is critical. We have a monthly all hands where we share all the figures of the company. We are very transparent. So revenues, cost, EBITDA, uh, growth, so everything. Uh, and we also have like a daily email that is sent to everyone with all the numbers of all the different markets, how different markets are performing against each other. Wow. And uh, usually uh, we see that people reply to that email, like, uh, you know, celebrating when, when they're first or like, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice, <laughs> nice way to to create internal competition, but also to make sure that everybody uh, feels part of the same the same unit. Absolutely, got it. And it's it's curious that um, in terms of the of of the of the team, I I feel that usually one hundred plus one hundred and fifty the the middle management layer or the senior management layer becomes more and more relevant to to scale a company. And we had the opportunity to talk about this uh, offline. So why is it important and how to do it in, in the right way? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. This is something that we, we've been experiencing uh, for the last uh, couple of years, which is uh, when the company grows, the type of uh, skills that you need within the company changes right so uh in the early days uh you know what we have is uh usually it's like the founders and then uh, some junior team uh, like it's like a very small group and, and you can control everything then what happens usually is that when you grow the junior superstars they get promoted and they become managers and they mm -hmm. start leading different teams uh, but at some point, these managers, they also need uh, some references. So, so they, they've been learning within SeedTech. They, they never had a, like a real uh, experience in a corporation. So you start, on one hand, they bring a lot of uh, ambition and a lot of energy, a lot of passion, and, and they understand the company inside out. But right. then you need to also incorporate profiles that are more experienced at leading a team, managing a big team, uh, so that the the company is, uh, is is more balanced. So that is what we've been doing for the last couple of years. Uh, we've been we continue promoting internal people because that's been proved to be absolutely amazing in terms of performance of the company, and creates also a culture 
of uh, of uh, yeah, like people think that they can make it, they, they they can be promoted and they can they can have an impact in the company. But at the same time, we've been hiring uh, a few people that were very experienced and very strong in their positions. And I think today we we have a, a very nice setup. Uh, for example, we brought a head of growth, a head of marketing, a head of design that they really add a lot of value to the organization. And at the same time, we promoted a head of programmatic operations. We have our head of, of our operation that was a, an intern. So, so yeah, I think it is important to mix uh, these two profiles. Right. Um, I think that that's one of the things that I learned across the years. It's it's really important to have the right people on the right seats for each stage of growth. But even more important, and that's what you have described, it, is to make them a team. And if we start feeling that we have uh, a team of outsiders and a team of insiders that are not able to work together, or even worse, just a team of outsiders, now the insiders don't uh, get to add any value to the growth of the company. Uh, it's it's really, there is a science of building a high performing team, but there is also a uh, a component of a, an art, right? And that's yeah. the tricky part and the difficult part of making that culture stick and evolve into into a more professional, but still keeping the the, the values uh, of the beginning uh, of the company. Uh, yeah. that, that's the difficult part, right? Yeah, it is because uh, at some point, uh, I mean, you always uh, have uh, this question in mind. It's, uh, uh, should I look for someone more senior for this position? Exactly. Uh, and the answer is not always yes. Uh, because, uh, yeah, if you bring too many outsiders, I think the culture is going to be damaged a lot. Exactly. Uh, and if you don't bring any, uh, you will probably will be missing a lot of skills and opportunities. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, it's not a science, as you were saying, but finding the, finding the right balance, I, I think, is one of the most critical parts. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. And uh, just a tip for, for the audience that are listening to us. It, that's why it's really important that, uh, of course, we need to have the right people on the right seats for each stage of growth. But if you can have some of those seats that can go through one or two stages, that would be good because we can change for every threshold of revenues uh, the entire leadership team because it will take time to create trust and to be in a company that is in high growth mode, doubling or tripling revenue, uh, you don't have the time to create that trust uh, from the scratch. So that's why putting too many people at the same time working together for the first time, it's a huge risk of yeah. uh, execution and alignment. And not only because of the time that it takes to create trust, uh, I think it's also because of the dynamics that you create within the company. So I used to work at management consulting before. And yeah. to me, one thing that was beautiful is that you, from, from day one, the path to partner was clear. So there, okay. was, there was a clear path on, on your development yeah. that if you perform well, you will get to the to the maximum level. Exactly. If you break that path, if people that are new in the company that are junior, they think that there is no way that they can get to a senior position, then you kill the organization because they don't have a driver for for the for the left for them for their high performance. However, if you are able to prove and to show the organization that if you do perform well, you're gonna be one of my leadership uh, people then yeah. they, they will kill it's themselves that sell off yeah that's powerful something also very interesting to to, to kind of highlight and and to learn from from seed tag is that um, usually we we talk a lot about organic growth but there is not so much experience in the market still in terms of inorgan inorganic growth or growth by m a acquisitions uh, which is which has been uh, your case in 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 recently. So, what has been your experience with with this kind of growth? So last year, uh, when the pandemic came, uh, of course uh, we we had a, a 
a couple of uh, months that were tough uh, because even if we are uh, digital uh, advertisers, they decided to cut their spend. Uh, so mm -hmm. our revenues went down to 50% uh, for a couple of months. Uh, however, we decided to uh, to see this as an opportunity and to uh, and to take an offensive position mm -hmm. and to explore uh, M&A opportunities. So we acquired two competitors, uh, one one in Italy where we do have an office, but they were kind of uh, getting a share of the market. So mm -hmm. we acquired them and we put together our office with the Atomic Ad Office, which is uh, the company that we acquired. And we acquired another one in Germany where we didn't have any presence. So it was more like a market, market entry uh, opportunity. Nice. Uh, it is, uh, so today, I think it was a great decision because uh, it accelerated the company a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And not only because of the growth that it brings, but also because of the perception of the market. Uh, when you are a company that does m a so for example right now we are talking to different uh, funds and, and of course discussing future uh, opportunities and all the funds all the uh, growth equities so everybody really think that it is an asset that we did m a in the past successfully so it's a, another skill set that you have in your company that is another revenue growth uh, engine and uh, it, it sends a, a very good si signal into the market. <laughs> and also for, for the ones who acquire companies for, for the first time, um, what, what would you recommend in terms of um, do's and don'ts uh, from your experience? Yeah. The most difficult part, uh, I believe, it is to identify the targets uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there are many companies uh, in the in the market but finding the right ones uh, is very difficult mm -hmm. so spend a lot of time doing a, a very good research and find a good target for you yeah. the second one is uh is making sure that the team is going to fit properly within your organization uh because at some point you're going to become one company and these guys will be part of your day to day uh, we are right now in the middle of that process. Uh, the Italian team uh, and the Italian merge was very fast because we already had the team in place. They knew each other and it's been absolutely amazing how in three months they're fully integrated. They're operating as one single team and, and they're really maximizing the revenues in the market. So it's been absolutely amazing. In Germany, we're in the middle of that, it is more difficult because we don't have a team in there, but still uh, the uh, the progress is very positive and we think that by the end of the year, we're gonna be in a, in a very good position. So yeah, making sure that the team is going to fit is, is critical. The, the third point I would say is uh, make sure that you negotiate a deal that works for both companies and that ensure that the target company has incentives to make it successful in the in the long term, not only in the short term. Exactly. So if you are Google, you may buy a company uh, and you don't care what happens uh, the day after because you're going to just take the product, put it into your big corporation, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you are a company in the size of SeedTag, you need to make sure that the next three years at least, uh, the founders of the target company, they're gonna be pushing as hard as you uh, to make sure that everything happens in the right way. Exactly. And that is a deal, deal, deal negotiation. So earn out, uh, structure, uh, shares, yeah. That That's really a, a good point and I, I kind of experienced that it, it's really, really critical to um, to have both sides on on the same page, uh, and kind of driving on on this with, with the same kind of vision and uh, end result uh, in mind. Yeah. And uh, in in that sense, 
what was your approach in terms of keeping the local brands or uniting the brand as, a, as the global brand, uh, as the brand of SeedTag? So what has been your approach there? We're putting everything under SeedTag uh, umbrella, under yeah. SeedTag brand. Uh, the main reason is uh, that we want SeedTag to be the leading player in, in contextual advertising worldwide. Uh, and for that, I think it is important that we have everything under the same brand. For example, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we wanted to have a presence in Germany is because we are starting to negotiate international deals from London. So more mm -hmm. like regional, regional deals, not only local. Right. And, and for that, we need to be able to uh, to, to talk to an advertiser in, in the UK and present that SeedTag is a European company with presence in these many markets. Uh, and the perception is different uh, compared to saying that, yeah, we have Precognified in Germany, this one in this. Uh, you know, I think the consistency, uh, it is important and, and the unified product and technology. Right. It's yeah. Really, really well done. Great. And um, any any insights about kind of managing growth within uh, Europe because you are exposed to Latin as you said in the beginning, but also to kind of growth uh, via European markets. As we know, there is a lot of discussion in ecosystem that it's it's much harder, much tougher to to grow through Europe given the different languages, uh, given different cultures, etc. Uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Then just going into the into the US and trying to make um, an American player uh, big, right? Yeah. Yeah, Europe is uh, so there is no Europe, so it's like a, a bunch of markets that, that you can go. <laughs> Uh, but Europe is just kind of a name, uh, uh, but there is no uh, European setup. So for us, uh, the reason why we started expanding into European markets was uh, because we didn't feel ready to go to the US uh, before. Uh, we wanted to learn how to internationalize the company, how to expand into a new market, how to start from scratch in in a different uh, environment before going for a big uh, for a big game in the nice. US. Uh, I think uh, it is easier to expand into Italy compared to expanding to the US, that is for sure. Mm -hmm. You need less resources and the likelihood of uh, being successful is higher. Mm -hmm. Of course, the price is lower because uh, you're not going to make uh, 500 million in, in Italy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you also reduce risk because, uh, for example, when we internationalized, we went to France, Italy, and Mexico at the same time. So mm -hmm. even if one market doesn't work, you have other two markets. So, so you kind of diversify your risk. Okay. If you just go to the US, you're putting all the all the eggs in, in one single basket. That, by the way, is a difficult basket. Yeah. So for, for us, it was a no-brainer to start from smaller markets that get ready. And now uh, we're in a position that, that we, we're planning to go to the US by the end of this year. Yeah. It's also interesting that uh, companies that go through the kind of the European path of, of growth also experience more the need of uh, considering growth by acquisition of local players because sometimes it's really difficult to penetrate on those markets and it takes a lot of time. So acquiring a local player decreases the time and increases the speed uh, of growth. And yeah. this, this is kind of what you also feel. Uh, so kind of trying to balance uh, the organic growth uh, and the growth by acquisitions or M&A. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to do to do the same in the US, but the problem is that the, the targets in the US are too expensive. So exactly. you can't afford Got to it. buy a, a local player in Italy. It is much more difficult to afford to buy a, a local player in the US because probably they are bigger than you are, you know. So exactly, and usually yeah. it, it's really the opposite of the exit, right? So the American player uh, buys the European yeah. player. Uh, so definitely, it makes it makes all sense. 
Great. So that's that's a great free uh, insights on how to lead uh, a decentralized uh, team with with nine different offices in different countries across Europe and and Latam. Uh, how to consider um, to grow, to to have a strong senior management team and our middle management team to be able to grow past 150 people now it's 200 people. And also uh, considering growth by um, M&A and your experience um, acquiring players in Italy and and Germany. So, so we came to the last question of uh, to the show and uh, of the show and one of our favorites. So if you'd have the opportunity to have a coffee uh, with your younger self at the beginning of CTAC, what advice would you tell to your younger Jorge? Uh, it's not, not an easy one, okay? Because uh, there are many, many learnings uh, that we got uh, down the road. Uh, if I have to pick one, I would say make sure that you you bring the best people possible into the team mm -hmm. because they they're gonna make the difference. And uh, ideally make sure that these people are experienced uh, in your industry. So, you know, the, the binder and that type of profile, mm -hmm. these are the guys that really accelerate the business. So when you face a new challenge, instead of trying to figure it out yourself, right. go find someone that faced that challenge before, bringing it into your company and rely on him or her to, uh, to crack it. Exactly. That that's a great point, and I think that you completely completed it at the end. Because sometimes we have the temptation of bringing those people that have done it, been there, done that before, and tell them what to do, right? And <laughs> and, and you, you said it. Trust them to bring their frameworks and and help them to adapt their frameworks, of course, to the to the present situation. But that's that's a really uh, good one that we all can benefit from. Jorge, thank you so much for making the time. It was a pleasure to have you on the show, and and congrats for the amazing journey since we met each other. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for for inviting me. Uh, a pleasure, like like always. And yeah, uh, let's keep in touch. Absolutely. So. Thanks for being on that side. As you see, we keep bringing you the best of the best, always with new insights to make your journey a little bit easier. So see you soon and keep scaling.